Hey everyone, so in this video we are going to show you how to use a combination of Ken shape and a couple lines of code in Unity to make easy destructible objects for your game. So Ken shape is a new easy to use 3D modeler. Basically what you do is you draw a 2D image and then it extrudes it out into the third dimension. So let's start there. So you just have to choose a size. So we'll use 16 by 16 and you don't have to use the whole image. I will, but you don't have to. I'm going to select the square tool and then I'm just going to select a color. And since this is, this is going to be just a wall, I'm just going to fill in every square. Now you could turn this into whatever you want. You could actually make a full house. You could make a skyscraper, whatever you want. I'm just going to use a wall to show you the basics. So if you want to like skip ahead like 15 or 20 seconds, but it shouldn't take long. Again, this is a very new application. It's version 1.0, so we don't have any kind of quality of life tools in this yet. I'm hoping the developer does add them, such as like a line tool, square, circle, triangle, things like that. Okay. So we've drawn the image, and then down here we change from draw to depth. So if, like I said, if you want to make a house, you would change these to larger numbers, like if you chose eight, you know, it would extrude it out eight, that kind of thing. And you would just do that across the whole object. But we're just going to stick with a wall. Click on preview. You can rotate it around. You can see it's just a wall. And this is the first thing that really matters is how you export it. So you need to select 3D and you need to se select FBX. This is important because one of the, it's not a guarantee which you're going to get to, which we're going to explain in a few seconds, but OBJ exports tend to be a solid object. So if you have a 3D model that uses a bunch of separate objects to make this final object, if you if you export as OBJ, it combines it into one. If you do FBX, it doesn't necessarily combine it. It keeps those individual shapes, and that's what we want. Every one of those squares that we looked at a second ago, we want them to be their own block. So you need to choose FBX. For texture, we can just do Atlas. And then in conjunction with FBX, we need to have optimized to off. So this is what I was talking about, where if you choose FBX, but optimize is on, it will still fuse all those together. So you want to keep those blocks separate. So FBX, Atlas, off, and then you click on export. And then when you do that, it'll just open up the typical Windows navigation and you save it where you want to. I'm going to save it into the folder for the unity project that i'm going to use as a demonstration and then i will be right back after i do that so as you can see the ken shape part is easy you're just going to draw your object and it's really the exporting that matters these settings so i'm going to export this and then i'll be right back okay and here we are in unity so so far all we have is a main camera so this is created when you create a new scene we have a directional light. The only change that I made to it is I shut off the shadows here, as you can see on the inspector. I shut off the shadows just so I could see easily on both sides of the wall. I added a plane. By default, it has a collider, although this really isn't necessary. Again, I was just checking a few things with the plane. And the last thing we're going to add is a, uh, a sphere. And then we have our wall down here that I saved. So the object that I made in... Ken shape, I called it wall. So let's go to game object, 3D object, sphere. We'll just push this over to the side for now. And let's see where our camera is. Our camera is right there. Okay, so for the sphere, it already comes with a collider, so that's good. We just need to add two things. We need to add physics, and we're gonna add a rigid body. This way we can give it uh, a velocity. We're not going to use gravity. Gravity would be fine, uh, but we want this to be predictable where it strikes, so we won't use gravity. Okay, so now we have to add a script, and this script only has one line of code, so you're talking super simple. So I already wrote the script, so I wouldn't waste your time, and the script is called ball, and we'll just drop it here, and let's just double-click and open that up. Like I said, one line of code. It's just get component rigid body. As we said, we added a rigid body and we're adding velocity and we're just giving it velocity on the Z axis. Okay, so the Z axis is this. Okay, 
In fact, if you look up here, you can see that it's Z that's changing. So we're putting velocity on the Z axis. As far as eight, I chose an arbitrary number, but basically one for every, uh, a single number here, okay? A one is one unity unit per second. So that means this is going to move eight unity units per second. How much is a unity unit? It's basically one block. So if you were to do game object, create object, and a cube, any one side of that, that's one unity unit. Just in case you're concerned, uh, we're wondering what velocity was measured in. Okay, so we now have a sphere that has a rigid body without gravity with velocity. And actually, let's just increase the mass. That way it doesn't bounce off what it hits. And now the second thing we're going to do, we're going to take the wall object and we're going to put this into the scene. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to shrink this a bit because for some reason, when you're exporting OBJs and FBXs and maybe even other types of uh, 3D models, when you're exporting them into Unity, they tend to be too big for some reason. So this one I'm going to shrink to half its size. So 0.5, apply, and it makes it smaller. Technically, I don't have to, but it makes it easier to manage so I can see everything on the screen without like pulling the camera way back. So if we click on the camera, there we go. All right, so first thing, let's move this off to the side. I don't want it to strike the wall yet. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to rotate this by 90 degrees. The only reason for it is when we want to select the individual blocks, it makes it easier to select it row by row. So that's all that is, is to make it easier to select. So we're just going to rotate this by 90 along the Z axis. So if I expand this out, you can see there's all the individual blocks. So if I select a few, see how it's selecting it horizontally? Because what I'm going to do is I'm not going to select the bottom. So by selecting it, uh, by rotating it, I could select it horizontally rather than vertically. That's the only reason why I did that. So what we're going to do, we're going to select everything. And technically, you could select the bottom too. It just makes the coding a little bit harder. I, I just want there to be like a foundation. So like if you're building the four walls, this way you could cause something to stay at the bottom so it doesn't like totally get obliterated. Okay, so I just did a shift click to select uh, all those. And then I just did a shift control to unclick the ones that I did not want. All right, so with all these blocks, we're gonna add three things. We're going to add a box collider. We didn't have to add a, a collider to the, the sphere because it already came with one, but we need to add colliders to the block boxes. We're gonna add rigid bodies, just like the sphere, and then we're gonna add a script. So add physics box collider. We're gonna set these two triggers and we're going to Add another physics object, and as I said, rigid body, and we're not going to use gravity. Okay. Now, for whatever reason, if I were to use gravity and I were to have these not be triggered so they're a solid and I had them sitting on flat ground, it would still fall. For whatever reason, with Unity, it seems like there's these kind of micro collisions happening. So even though there's no motion, it's like as if there's this ever so slight micro collision and it falls apart. So you kind of have to do a couple things to keep that from happening. So that's the main purpose of the script that I'm about to show you is it basically locks everything into place until you want gravity to take over. So technically you really don't need gravity doing anything until you're ready for this to fall apart. And when do you want it to, be fall, to fall apart? When there's a collision. So it works out pretty good. And uh, at the end, I'll do a little heads up about scaling as far as how well this scales for like a full project. Okay. So we've added the box collider. We set it to a trigger. We've added the rigid body. We shut off gravity. And now we're going to use our other script called block. And we'll just drop that there. And we'll open that up. Okay, so in block, only got about 10 lines of code here. So you're going to add on trigger enter. In fact, this other stuff will automatically populate. So as soon as you start typing on trigger, this rest of this will pop up once you select on trigger enter. So why on trigger enter? Because all the boxes are triggers. OK, 
Okay, so we want to check when a collision with one of those triggers has happened. And again, this script is attached only to the blocks. And it's looking for other. The other is going to be the sphere. Well, how do we know that? Because we specifically say, if that other, see how it's highlighting them both? That's what this is referring to. If the other object involved with the collision, if its name is sphere, and if we come over here, you can see, sure enough, it's called sphere. Capitalization matters. So if the object colliding with the block is sphere, then we want a few things to happen. We don't longer want it to be a trigger. So is trigger becomes false. So effectively it unchecks that. Second thing, use gravity enabled. It checks that. So the two changes we made, we undo those changes. That way it's now checking for these things. But this is only happening to the objects where the sphere is colliding. Okay, so the other blocks won't be affected. So if I was to run it like this, basically what would happen is uh, the sphere probably could hit up to four blocks if it hits like a four-way intersection, and that's it. Just those four blocks would go flying. Well, we want more than that. So unless you're trying to do like some kind of uh, sniper shot and you want minimal dam damage, but if you want this more kind of all-inclusive damage, then you're going to want to keep going. And the last thing is move. We want to have the, the tag of the object called move. Okay, so the reason for this, as we said, we're shutting off the trigger and we're shutting off, uh, excuse me, we're enabling trigger and we're shutting off gravity by default. Okay, what we want to do is we want to track which ones have been enabled and which ones have not. That way we can track which blocks are moving. So when this happens, okay, we can then check for which blocks are in motion. So what we're going to do is, again, with all those blocks selected, we're going to come up here and we're going to choose move. So by default, these are not here. You have to add them. You just click on add and you type it. So by default, I, I said move, sorry. By default, they're going to be idle, they're, which stands to reason. They're not moving. They should be idle. And then once they get collided with the sphere, they're moving. Now, the second thing is on trigger stay. Okay, we can't use on trigger enter because enter happens for one frame and one frame alone, and that is when the collision has occurred. So what we need to do is we need to look to see if a collision is ongoing. And what do we do? Well, now we're only checking the ones that are still idle. So if the tag of if the block is idle, and this time other is referring to the other blocks because if the other game object dot tag is move remember we changed it to move here then do the same thing so these two things are very very similar it's just what's causing it these blocks are moving if the um, if the sphere collides with them these blocks are moving if another block collides with them but we like I said, there's always these minor collisions going on, so we don't want to activate them until they've actually been struck by something that has been struck by the sphere, and then something that has been struck by something that has been struck by the sphere, or else it just collapse in place. I hope I explained that well. It's a little confusing, but if you you'll see what happens if you try building something out of blocks and you don't do this. If you don't do this, it like I said, it just falls apart on its own. Okay, so if I haven't forgotten anything, that will actually do it already. So let's take our sphere, let's move it in line, and oops, yeah, that'll hit in the middle. Okay, so let's run this and hope I did not forget anything. There you go. And that's it. So that's how you can make an object be easily destructible. So my explanation probably wasn't the greatest, but you can't deny the fact that it's only about eight lines of code. So that should about do it. But the, I do want to mention one thing. So someone in the comments section, rightfully so, is going to say this does not scale. They're kind of right, because the more colliders and the more rigid bodies, the more resource intensive this will become. However, you can use this for a couple things. One, you can use this for proof of concept. 
beta, uh, not beta testing. Uh, basically, if you're just testing, again, proof of concept, placeholder functionality, because you might not want to go through all the trouble of doing mesh deforming and things like that if you don't know if you even want things to be destructible. So by doing something like this, you can test the functionality of destructibility very easily. Okay. And you can actually make this scale out more because what you can do, there's this very old uh, process that, that used to be done, and that is there was two versions of every object. There would be an object solid, and then when a collision occurs, the object is replaced with something that is destructible. So you'd actually have two walls. So remember how I said in this tool, you could do FBX optimized on and off? So you would actually do it twice. You would optimize it once and then not optimize it the other time. And so what would happen is you would detect a collision with the optimized version. And then when that collision occurs, you now replace it with this more resource intensive version. So that's another way that you could use this. So again, um, you could do that to try to make this scale out more. You could use it just for proof of concept. You could actually use this for a small scale game too. Like maybe you want to make an update of Rampage, okay? And you want just a small, maybe, uh, you know, six building area because the buildings weren't ever that big in Rampage. So you could make maybe six or eight buildings somewhere around that is probably when this would start to break down, no pun intended. So you could do like something like Rampage like this. That way when the monster hits the building, it collapses. Not to mention once a building is destroyed, you could add additional code that then deletes the blocks, which means that every time a block gets destroyed, the system would run better and better and better. In fact, you've seen that in very old arcade games. Like if you think Space Evaders, one of the reasons why they move so slow at first is because the processor just couldn't handle it and then they move faster. So that wasn't just a difficulty issue. That was simply the, the system running at a, at a, at a, at a crawl, and, but they liked that. They liked that dynamic of the fact that it could run faster. And so they, they did things to uh, indicate it, like they had the music speed up and things like that. But originally, that was just the system not being able to handle it. So you, you, can, you can look to older games like that and say, okay, we can use this. That we can, like I said, you can replace the solid object with the breakable object. You can do things like once it breaks, you can then delete those blocks. That way it frees up resources and that the game would run better at that point. So... Um, that's about it. So again, a lot of what I do is meant to be instructional. I'm not saying that this is the best way to do it. I'm not saying this is the only way to do it. And I'm not saying that you should implement this in your game, the big, you know, 3D free roam opening game. I'm just saying that this does work. And now you've seen how to use a few different commands. So anyways, if you'd like to see more of this, just let me know. Just leave a comment and a like, and that should about do it. I'm thinking I'm going to do at least one or two more examples of these anyways. And um, so that should about do it. So please enjoy the rest of your day.